All right. Well, this video is going to be a little bit different. This is not uh, a Lamentations video this time. I'll get back to that eventually. But today is October 31st. So the other night I thought that maybe I should actually do a video about Halloween. And so today I'm going to kind of give a little summary about Halloween and its history and just some various opinions from different Christian teachers and, uh, you know, maybe some scriptures to help deal with this subject and my own thoughts at the very end about maybe what to do with Halloween. Yeah, and I don't know how long this is going to be, but uh, I'll just see what happens. Okay. So, as I go through this, I'm going to be referring to different sources as I go. So, and I'll mention those as I go. That way I'm not plagiarizing. Alright, so, what about the history of Halloween? So, Halloween, according to this Christian YouTube channel called Answers in Genesis... And I also use this website called Got Questions, which is a Christian website that answers all sorts of questions. It's a very good resource. So some of these notes are going to come from both of these. So uh, according to Answers in Genesis, Halloween goes back to this ancient group of people called the Celts. And actually you get the uh, basketball team, the Bostic Celtics, yeah. Yeah, from this name. And they lived pretty much in the uh, United Kingdom area. And they were actually descendants of this guy named Gomer, who was a descendant of Noah, uh, who was a descendant of Noah in the book of Genesis. And Well, he was actually the son of Noah's son, uh, Japheth. This is in verse 2. The sons of Japheth were Gomer, Magog... Yeah, Madai, Javan, Tabal, and so on. All right. And these uh, Celts, Celts, however you say it, they actually had a uh, festival that they would have, this Druid festi a festival called Samhain. And it has, and it's spelled weird, called S, it's, it's spelled S A M H. A-I-N, yeah, but it's not Sam Hain, it's Sawin, so very weird. And that's for, I got that from Got Questions. And it's, all right, and then uh, Got Questions said that basically in this festival, they would sacrifice animals and plants and even people as well. And also, the Celts believed that even the dead could walk among the living at this time. And scholars believe that Halloween's association with ghosts and food and fortune-telling actually began with these pagan customs. Yeah, where the Celts would, you know, have their festival and then they would even dress up in weird costumes to, you know, to try to ward off these supposed uh, evil spirits who would supposedly be coming back from the dead around this time this this superstitious pagan belief and then i also got some stuff from bubbles uh, sorry from <laughs> bible study uh, tools.com and on there it actually said that during Sam uh, Samhain, sorry it was actually believed that the veil between the living and the dead was the thinnest and uh People made offerings or engaged in rituals to appease wandering spirits. And History.com said that people would light bonfires and wear costumes to ward off ghosts. So that they would be doing these things during that festival. So very, very, uh, uh, very, very pagan. And... It said that it was a Druid festival. Now, who were the Druids? Well, Answers in Genesis said that uh, 
that uh, the Druids were the religious leaders of the Celts. And they worshipped ancestors, and they worshipped many gods, and they also believed in reincarnation. And they pretty much rose in prominence around 700 BC or so. All right, but that's some of, you know, where it comes from. Yeah, where Halloween actually comes from. Now, what about that name, Halloween? Yeah, what do you do with that? Well, in the early A.D. 600s, a, a pope named Boniface IV created this day called All Saints Day, to honor the saints on May 13th. And its purpose is to commemorate the uh, lives of all the saints. And it was based on the belief of the communion of the living and the dead, and also to ask for their intercession before God. That's what God Question said. And I think that previous point came from uh, Answers in Genesis. And so did this point. In the 700 A.D.s, Pope Gregory III moved All Saints Day from May 13th to November 1st, according to Answers in Genesis. And uh, Got Question says that some people put out food for their ancestors, or they left a uh, lantern burning in the window so that ghosts could find their way home for the night. And the evening before All Saints Day, yeah, All Saints Day was actually called All Hallows. And the evening before that would be called All Hallows Eve, where a big festival was held. Yeah, got questions, says that. And the emphasis on spirits and ghosts and goblins, and witches and other dark images, they actually came about from the superstition that the dark forces were active right before All Saints Day to hinder the prayer for the dead that would be offered on the next day. And the practice of trick-or-treating actually uh, dates back to the Middle Ages whenever poor people would go door-to-door -door begging for food in exchange for their prayers for the dead. So that's also from Got Questions. And there was actually another day that was created as well. He also had this day called All Souls Day. And History.com said that this started around the year uh, 1000, whenever Christianity really started to influence that Celtic region or whatever. And... Uh, it pretty much was similar to the Samhain festival. It just, I guess, became more Christianized. And people basically dressed up in costumes as saints and angels and devils. And then Answers in Genesis also says this, that scholars connect the uh, how that connect Halloween and other days of the dead because you had other cultures that would do the Day of the Dead as well, that would be going around all over the world. And I know in Mexico, they have that El Dia de los Muertos, the yeah, Day of the Dead. But pretty much all of these other Days of the Dead and Halloween or whatever, they go back to the flood of Noah's Day, whenever and whenever he offered sacrifices. They all get traced back to that. And uh, in, no, in Genesis 8, verse 20, it says, Noah built an altar to the Lord, and he took every clean animal and of every clean burn, uh, bird and offered burnt offerings on the altar. And verse 21 says, The Lord smelled a soothing aroma. And then the Lord said in his heart, I will never again curse the ground for man's sake. Yep, and... Ultimately, that would be a foreshadowing to the ultimate sacrifice for sin. Yep, for Jesus. Yep, but then eventually over time, especially after the Tower of Babel, whenever people were scattered, uh, sacrifices basically ended up 
becoming corrupted. Yeah, but ultimately, whenever sacrifice started, it was to atone for the sin of people. But ultimately, an animal covering would not be enough. It would have to take God's only son to deal with sin once and for all. Yeah, and the first sacrifice actually happens all the way back in Genesis, according to answers in Genesis. So, the first sacrifice happened right after the fall, and after God uh, spoke punishments for the fall. And uh, God made tunics of skin and clothed Adam and Eve with them. Yep. And covered them, ultimately. Yep, and MacArthur says this, the first physical deaths... They should have been the man and his wife, but it was an animal. It was a shadow of the reality that God would someday kill a substitute to redeem sinners. Yeah, and also in verse 15, pretty much it's the proto uh, elogarion, uh, elogarion, uh, gelion, however you say that, where you pretty much have the gospel at the very beginning of the book. Yeah, whenever... Uh, God curses the serpent, and he says, I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed. Seed is capitalized. And he shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. And the seed of the woman is Jesus, yeah, who would ultimately crush the devil. Yeah, he would destroy the works of the devil and yeah, pay the price for sin. Yeah, the wages of sin is death. He died in our place. Yep, yeah, we can be forgiven and have eternal life. Amen. All right, but anyway, that's a little bit of the history of you know sacrifice and all that because you know the cause sacrifice was a part of you know the of the history of Halloween and all that and just even though it was paganized. All right, and also, uh, what about Halloween in the U.S.? You know, how did how did this holiday get started in the U.S.? How did that happen? Well, according to Got Questions, the Irish and the Scots they actually brought Halloween over whenever they migrated to the U.S. in like the nineteen uh, hundreds or so. Yeah, and. Also, Irish immigrants, they brought their jack-o'-lanterns tradition to America. History.com has some something to say about jack-o'-lanterns. It actually comes from this Irish legend about this guy named Stingy Jack. And basically, in this legend, uh, this guy Jack wanted a drink... And so he wanted basically the devil to turn into a coin to, so he could buy a drink. But he decided, and the devil did turn into a coin. But uh, but Jack chose to keep the coin and he put it in his pocket next to this silver cross. And it kept the devil from turning back into himself. But eventually uh, Jack ended up freeing the devil. But he made a bargain with him to not, you know, take his soul and to just leave him alone for a year. But then later on, Jack tricks the devil to climb up into a tree to get some fruit for him or whatever. But then he carves out this uh, cross, and basically it keeps the devil up in the tree, and he can't come down. Yeah, but he uh, makes another bargain with the devil to like leave him alone for 10 years or whatever. But eventually Jack dies, and God doesn't let him into heaven. But but also, uh, the devil actually doesn't let Jack into hell, yeah, since, you know, he didn't lay claim on his soul in that bargain. He promised to leave him alone, so I guess didn't want to let him into hell either, even though there's already biblical issues with this, but anyway. Yeah, but, but pretty much... He wasn't allowed into heaven or hell, and so he had to go and roam the earth, and he was given like this burning coal, and he put it inside this carved out 
turnip, and he just keeps roaming the earth to this day. And the Irish referred to this ghostly creature as the Jack of the Lantern, and eventually morphed into Jack-o'-lantern. So that's where that comes from. All right, well, that was from History.com, and then Got Questions says that German immigrants actually brought uh, a vivid witchcraft, brought vivid witchcraft lore, and even uh, Haitian and African peoples, they brought native voodoo beliefs about black cats and fire and witchcraft and all that. I wonder if that's where you get the idea for bad luck and you know friday the 13th and stuff like that i wonder if some of that comes from these things maybe but i didn't really look into that and ultimately when these things started to get brought brought into the united states halloween began to really explode and especially in the 1930s and trick-or-treating became big as well and and then it ended up becoming this national holiday or whatever. So that's some of the history of how Halloween uh, came to uh, the U.S., basically. All right, now with a little bit of that history, there's actually some different viewpoints from some different teachers. And this first, uh, this first one comes from this Christian YouTuber named Doreen Virtue, who used to be a, a new age, uh, who used to be a teacher in the New Age, but God saved her out of that. And one of her episodes that she did on Halloween, she had this guy, this pastor named Justin Pierce, come on, and he talked a little bit. And he brought up First uh, Peter three fifteen, which tells us to be holy. And he also said that we're in a spiritual battle and pretty much, you know, participating in Halloween and all that. It's it's a worship of demons. And pretty much whenever you uh, have like a trunk or tree or a fall festival and all that, you're pretty much compromising with the world and you, and you're doing it in order to be accepted. And of course, James 4.4 4 says, you know, if you seek to be friends with the world, you make yourself an enemy of God. And sometimes also you compromise in order for you to want to be God. You just want to do what you want to do. Yeah, as in going back to Genesis 3, that if you eat the tree, that you shall be like God, you know, knowing good and evil or whatever. And then he actually gave a little bit of history as well. He actually said the uh, Christianization of Samhain was during the Druid festivals. Yeah, yeah, the Christianization of uh, Samhain. Sorry, it was actually uh, yeah was when the Druid festi festival uh, festivals they were. Uh, brought into All Saints Day, and Pope Boniface IV did that around 600. And then Gregory, uh, Pope Gregory moved this to uh, October 31st, uh, October, uh, uh, well, moved All Saints Day to uh, November 1st. And you know, Justin said that because it incorporated the uh, Catholic idea of purgatory, that basically you can pray to the dead or whatever, and maybe you can pray that they can get out of purgatory or something out like that. Just Roman Catholic teaching. And then he also said that really if you're uh, participating in Halloween or whatever, you're actually teaching your kids to practice idolatry, and so you should repent. And then at the very end, he actually kind of gave some ideas of what you can do. He said that you can just pass out some non-Halloween candy and even maybe some Ray Comfort gospel tracks or whatever. Yeah, so those were just some of what was said in that video. And it was pretty good. And that guy actually wrote a book on the history of Halloween, but I didn't read it, so... So I guess some of that comes from that book, so... All right, and then speaking of Ray Comfort, he actually had his he had a video on Halloween, and he uh, 
actually gave some ideas on what to do during Halloween. He uh, says that you should not run and hide. You don't, you know, run and hide or turn the lights out at your house whenever people come knock on the door or whatever. Yeah. But also you should have maybe a large table of treats and maybe even tracks at your church. So if you did like this event or maybe even a festival or whatever, maybe you can have a large table of candy, maybe some non-Halloween candy or whatever. Yeah, and just maybe gospel tracks as well. And you can also order a uh, outreach track box from livingwaters.com. And yeah, and I've used some of those. They're they're pretty cool. Yeah, one of them has like a million dollar bill with like a jack-o'-lantern on it. And then like an Albert Einstein little kitty pamphlet or whatever. So pretty cool stuff. And then uh, the uh, president of the of, of Southern Baptist Theological Seminary or whatever, this guy, uh, Al Mohler, he actually says that we should not celebrate Halloween, but you could probably still dress your kids up in appropriate costumes and maybe just ask for candy. And this holiday is stooped in paganism. It's developed a fascination with the occult. That's what he said. And then John MacArthur says that it was, it's no, it's just ridiculous, it's demonic, don't celebrate it at all. Have a fall festival. And I don't, he may have been sarcastic when he said that, but I don't know. It was during a Q&A. And then Christian YouTuber Mike Winger, he uh, says that Halloween today isn't the same as it was before. Yeah, I mean, you don't have the sacrifices being offered to false gods or burning crops or animals and all that. Yeah, you may not have that, but it did but but it did come from that stuff. Yeah, and then you can use candy and tracks as well. You can also go door to door and maybe give out tracks if you want to, but don't wear a, a bad costume. You know, don't wear a a uh, monstrous costume or vampire or zombie or Frankenstein or whatever. Maybe you could wear Superman or Wonder Woman or something. Or a cowboy. And then Christian YouTuber Alan Parr at this channel called The Beat, he uh, said, don't tell people what to do or what not to do. Because it's not like totally black and white or whatever. Yeah, and you can celebrate, just don't wear any bad costumes. And then Christian YouTuber Spencer Smith, who has these documentaries called Third Adam. Those are pretty good. You should go check those out. He also said don't participate and also give them a tract or the word of God as well. All right, now this guy is going to have a little bit more detail. So this guy, uh, Lutheran pastor Chris Roseborough, he's got a YouTube channel called Fighting for the Faith. It's really good. You should go check that out. But he actually gave some more history of Halloween as well whenever he did a live stream not too long ago. But he said that the church fathers actually had liturgies you know, just how a worship is set up and structured, church service or whatever. But they were modified from Jewish synagogues. And you also had an annual set of readings from each week of the year to teach the whole Bible. And close to the end of the year, the church dedicated the last few weeks to deal with eschatology, which would be studying the end times. And leading into that, you had a feast on November 1st called All Saints Day. And it commemorates deceased Christians and it comforts Christians in the fact that those asleep are now with Christ. And this can help, this helps deal with studying the end times. That even though it's going to get harder in the end times, so there will be more suffering and persecution, we can have confidence that will be with Christ and even the loved ones and that have gone to be with Christ or there and even the ones who have been martyred as well 
So that's what Chris says that All Saints Day what that it was it was all of this originally. It was to remember those who were now with Christ. But within Roman Catholic circles and other circles that didn't know the Bible, the focus wasn't on saints worshiping God, but it, it became about death. So it became paganized over time where All Hallows' Eve became Halloween. So I guess whenever Pope Boniface and Gregory came along, that's when it started to, maybe it started to get, you know, paganized whenever it was blending in the Shawin stuff as well. But I guess originally with the Church Fathers, I guess... It wasn't about any of that stuff until later on when it got merged. So originally it was not about witchcraft, but it was remembering past saints. Yeah. And uh, Chris Roseboro says that you actually have the freedom to trick-or-treat or not, but don't judge another Christian's decisions and basically make decisions on the history. You know, whether or not you should celebra celebrate or do things or not. And there's one other person I'm going to look at right here. He's actually the founder of the Church of Satan. But he was quoted in a video by this Christian YouTube channel called Vision Unsealed, who uh, actually looked at some of these different people that I mentioned. Yeah, like Alan Parr and Mike Winger and Ray Comfort and so on. But the founder of the Church of Satan, Anton LaVey, he actually said this, By dressing up either by wearing a costume or coloring oneself for Halloween, it's actually tantamount to worshiping the devil. And he also said, I am glad that Christian parents let their children worship the devil at least one night of the year. Hmm. Okay, so there's actually some scriptures to consider probably in dealing with Halloween, and I'm going to go through some of those. So the first one I may want to look at, I may not look at all of these, but I'm going to probably look at some of them. So here's some scriptures to consider, starting with... Uh, Exodus 22, verse 18. So Exodus 22, verse 18, he says, You shall not permit, Moses says, You shall not permit a sorceress to live. Yeah, and MacArthur says it's a woman who practices occultism. And then Leviticus 19, 31, I think, kind of says the same thing. But I'll turn to that. Leviticus 19.31 yeah, Give no regard to mediums and familiar spirits. Do not seek after them to be defiled by them. I am the Lord your God. And MacArthur says that mediums are humans who act as go-betweens to supposedly contact or communicate with spirits of the dead who are actually imper impersonated by demons. And then Leviticus 20 verse 6 says the person who turns to mediums and familiar spirits to prostitute himself with them I will set my face against that person and cut him off from his people and then verse 27 a man or a woman who is a medium or who has familiar spirits shall surely be put to death and they shall stone them with stones and their blood shall be upon them and then Deuteronomy 18 verses 10 through 12 says this so there shall not be found anyone among you who makes his son or daughter pass through fire or who practices witchcraft or is a soothsayer or interprets omens or who is a sorcerer or one who conjures spells, or a medium, or a spiritist, or one who calls up the dead, which would be necromancy. 
All right, and then you actually have a violation of this in uh, 1 Samuel 28. I'll go ahead and summarize 1 Samuel 28, but that's whenever King Saul goes to seek out a uh, medium since he's worried about the Philistines closing in on him. So we go, even though he actually banned all mediums, but he goes to seek out one in Endor, and he disguises himself. And uh, she brings up Samuel, because the prophet Samuel was already dead at this point. And, he, uh, and Samuel tells uh, Saul that, yeah, you're toast. Yeah, you are going to die. And the next day, he ultimately did. He died in battle. And then Proverbs actually says this as well. So Proverbs says this. This I, I got this from Got Genesis. Oh, sorry, sorry. I got this from a Answers in Genesis, not Got Genesis. Sorry. Oh boy. Proverbs eight thirty six. Here, Let's see if I can find it. Oh, too far. And there it is. But whoever sins against me wrongs his own soul, and all those who hate me love death. And MacArthur says, Since wisdom is the source of life, anyone hating wisdom so as to spurn it is acting as if he loves death. And ultimately this holiday holiday is about death. Yeah. Yeah. And about honoring the dead. Yeah, you know, well, all Saints Day turned into that stuff. All right, and then going to the New Testament. In dealing with this, these things, yeah, Acts 4.12, you know, Peter says, There's no other name under heaven by which man can be saved. In dealing with this issue of intercessory prayer, and maybe to get people out of purgatory or whatever, that doesn't happen. You can't do that. As, and you're not saved by that stuff. Yeah, and you can't intercede for others. And 1 Timothy 2.5 says there's only one mediator, Jesus Christ. Yeah. And then in Acts 8, you actually have an incident with this sorcerer named Simon. I may go ahead and read this because this is pretty good. So Acts 8, you got this. Let me find it. But it was whenever the gospel was being preached in Samaria. People were getting saved. Demons were being cast out. It was awesome. And the apostles, you know, came yeah, now Saul, yeah, yeah, Saul, Paul, he was still not saved at this point. He was still persecuting Christians. But anyway, but Samaritans were getting saved. And even this sorcerer called Simon, he actually uh, said that the evangelist Philip had great power of God. And uh, Simon the sorcerer showed himself to believe and he was baptized. He continued with Philip and he was just amazed at all the miracles that were being done. And the apostles heard about what was going on and Peter and John come down and they pray for the people to receive the Holy Spirit. And they did. And then Simon the sorcerer saw the laying on of hands of the apostles and as a result the spirit was being given he was so fascinated by that that he offered them money and he said give me this power also so that anyone whom i lay hands may receive the holy spirit but then peter said your money perish with you because you thought that the gift of god could be purchased with money you have neither part nor portion in this matter, for your heart is not right in the sight of God. So repent, therefore, of this uh, of this your wickedness, and pray 
God, if perhaps the thought of your heart may be forgiven you. For I say that you are poisoned by bitterness and bound in iniquity. And then Simon said, Pray to the Lord for me that none of these things which you have spoken come upon me. So, so basically, uh, MacArthur says that uh, although Simon was certainly fearful after what Peter said, he was certainly unwilling to repent and to seek forgiveness, wanting only to escape the consequences of his sin. Yeah, asking Peter to pray for him that none of these things come upon me, as you say. Yeah, I just don't want these things to come upon me. Yeah, but the point is he wanted to use the power of the Spirit for himself, just to make himself even more powerful or whatever. So he was only he was only just fascinated with the miracles and all that. And uh, MacArthur says that Simon's belief was just motivated by selfish reasons and he could and it was never genuine. So whenever he supposedly believed, whenever Philip was preaching the gospel and, and miracles were being done, his belief was not real, basically. Yeah, he saw he saw it. Yeah, he saw it as an external act. He saw it as an external act, useful to gain the power he believed that Philip possessed, and by following Philip, he was he was able to maintain contact with his former audience. Yeah, the people that actually followed this guy, but they were being saved. Yeah, so he just wanted this power for himself. So, yeah. But the point is, he never really turned from his occultism and sorcery and all that stuff. But he just wanted this extra power that he saw with Philip on top of it. Yeah, and he tried to buy the power of the Spirit for money, and Peter rebuked him. So, but anyway, that may be a good scripture to consider. All right, and then also in Acts 13... Of course, in Acts 9, Saul gets converted and starts preaching the gospel. And then event, and then in Acts 13, when he goes on his first missionary journey with Barnabas, they go to uh, Cyprus. And it's also in this chapter whenever uh, Saul now becomes known as Paul in verse 9. Uh, whenever Saul is on... Cyprus, the island of Cyprus, they go to this place called Paphos and they find this uh, sorcerer and false prophet named Bar-Jesus yeah, or Elymas. Yeah, that's the Greek name of Bar-Jesus. That's what uh, MacArthur says. But uh, he was with the proconsul who was the Roman who was a Roman official who served as provincial governor since the Roman Empire was divided into provinces and and uh, Pontius Pilate that whom Jesus was crucified under was one of these proconsuls one of these governors but you had this governor named Sergius Paulus and he was a very intelligent man and this guy called for Barnabas and Saul Paul and he sought to hear the word of God, but the sorcerer, Bar-Jesus, Elymas, he withstood them and he tried to turn the governor away from the faith. But Saul, Paul said, uh, O fool of deceit and all fraud, you son of the devil, you enemy of all righteousness, will you not cease perverting the straight ways of the Lord? And now indeed the hand of the Lord is upon you and you shall be blind, not seeing the sun for a time. And then immediately a dark mist fell on him and he went around seeking someone to lead him by the hand. And then the proconsul believed when he saw what had been done, being astonished at the teaching of the Lord. Alright, amen. So this governor got saved. Yeah, amen and amen. And by the way, Saul, Paul, 
you know, Saul was actually uh, Paul's Hebrew name, and Paul was the Roman name. So, it's just using the different names, but it's not actually changing names. So, so that's why you have Saul, Paul, especially since now, you know, he's going to the Gentiles. So, I guess it would be more fitting to use the Roman name. So, yeah. All right. Well, anyway, the point is just just some uh, some examples of sorcerer, sorcerers, basically. And then there's another example in uh, in uh, Acts 16, whenever Paul is on his second missionary journey and he is in Philippi. And while he's there, uh, there's this slave girl who has this spirit of divination who made her masters a lot of money by fortune telling. She followed Paul and said that these men are servants of the Most High God. Who proclaimed to us the way of salvation and she did this for many days but Paul was greatly annoyed and he turned to that spirit and said I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her and then he came out of her and then the masters got mad and they got dragged to the authorities and then uh, Paul and Silas were beaten up and thrown in prison and it goes and then it goes on and then of course they're singing in prison. God shakes the prison. And they, they get loosened. And then the jailer almost kills himself. But then Paul says, don't do that. We're all here. Well, what must I do to be saved? Believe on the Lord Jesus. And then that jailer and his household all get baptized. And then eventually Paul and Silas, yeah, they leave uh, Philippi. And then Paul goes to Thessalonica. All right, but anyway, just another example of, you know, sorcery and witchcraft and all that, which I think these scriptures would be relevant with this issue with Halloween since you have that stuff associated with it as a part of it. So, And then also in Acts 19 on the third missionary journey in Ephesus, after a uh, failed attempt to cast out some spirits by the sons of Sceva, that didn't go very well for them. Yeah, you actually had many people who practiced magic. They uh, brought their books and they burned them. And uh, they got saved. Yeah, they repented of their witchcraft and all that. You know, it's awesome, 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 awesome. And then another, and then probably another uh, chapter to consider, other than First Samuel twenty-eight. I don't. There might be some disagreement, but Chris Roseborough kind of brought this up whenever he gave his thoughts in chapter fourteen of Romans that we have freedom in Christ, but ultimately. Uh, But ultimately, uh, you need to not cause your brother to stumble with what you do. Yeah, let us pursue the things which make peace and the things by which we may edify one another. Yep. And it's good to neither eat meat nor drink wine nor do nothing by which your brother stumbles or is offended or made weak. And uh, also, don't you have faith? Have it to yourself before God. Happy is he who does not condemn himself in what he approves. So MacArthur says that the strongest Christian can bring harm to himself in the area of Christian liberty by denouncing or belittling freedom God has give, given him or by carelessly flaunting his liberty without having any regard of how it might affect other people so if some of those other christians are right that maybe you can still go go around and get candy and maybe dress up in appropriate costumes you need to keep in mind that it could offend other christians and it could cause some to stumble or maybe 
get the wrong ideas. So that needs to be kept in mind, even if maybe you could do that thing that's not wicked and good conscience. Yeah. And then, of course, uh, 1 Corinthians 8, dealing with, you know, whether or not you should eat meat. Basically, I'll eat the meat, but if it never, but if it causes somebody to stumble, then I'm not going to eat it again. Yeah. Yeah. Now, don't use that to justify uh, doing anything wicked, obviously. Yeah. But if you're not doing something wicked, or maybe you don't do the witchcraft stuff, maybe you don't go to the haunted houses, or uh, maybe uh, wear bad costumes, or whatever. Yeah, maybe you just get some candy, or or whatever. You, maybe you just do that, or whatever. Yeah, but if, but if it can cause somebody to have the wrong idea, then maybe it's best not to. Yeah, but obviously stay away from the other wicked stuff. All right, and then, and then, also, First uh, Corinthians uh, five six, dealing with uh, sin in the church, not dealing with this guy that was sleeping with his uh, uh, father's wife, and uh, yeah, just being okay with that and. Yeah, and Paul said you need to put this guy out of the church, and a little yeah, a little leaven leavens the whole lump. And MacArthur says that basically uh, leaven in this case is referring to sin, and whenever it's tolerated, sin will permeate and corrupt the whole church. And then of course another argument could be that you need to stay away from everything altogether. I think from that Justin Pierce guy, you need to stay away from pretty much the trick-or-treating and all that stuff and even wearing costumes. Stay away from that stuff too because it ultimately could you know, creep into the church and cause all sorts of damage or whatever. Yeah, the little leaven leavens the whole lump and that's a good argument also. And also, uh, this Justin Pierce guy referred to uh, 1 Corinthians 10.20 in that video. So rather that the things which the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to demons and not to God. And I do not want you to have fellowship with demons. And then 21, you cannot drink of the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons. And so MacArthur says that idols and the things sacrificed to them, they have no spiritual nature or no power in themselves, but they represent the demonic. So if pagan believers, so if pagan worshippers believe in an idol, believe an idol was a god, then demons act out the part of the imagined god. There is not a true god in the idol. It's only just a satanic spiritual force. So, you worship anything other than God, basically you're worshiping demons, and ultimately yourself. And so, pretty much the argument is that, yeah, Halloween is demonic, and you're, you're partaking of that stuff if you're participating and celebrating Halloween. And, I, and that's a good, that's probably a good argument, I would say. All right, and then 1 Corinthians 15, in dealing with the topic of death, uh, yeah, in dealing with death, uh, Paul says in verse 26, the enemy that will last be destroyed is death. Yep, and MacArthur says that Christ has broken the power of Satan who held the power of death at the cross. But Satan will not be permanently divested of his weapon of death until the end of the millennium. However you interpret the millennium in Revelation 20, but anyway. And at that point, having fulfilled the uh, complete prophecy of Psalm 8, verse 6, Christ will then deliver the kingdom 
will deliver the kingdom to his father and the eternal glory of uh, Revelation 21 and 22 will begin. Yeah, what does Psalm 8, 6 say? Let me turn to that real quick. Yeah, Psalm 8, 6. I'll find it. 8, 6. And there it is. You have made him to have dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under his feet. Yep, and these verses emphasize the significance of man who was created in the image and likeness of God to exercise dominion over the rest of creation. But ultimately, Christ has dominion. Yeah, and verse 5 says, You made him a little lower than the angels. You have crowned him with glory and honor. Yeah, and this is actually in the book of Hebrews. Yeah, so Christ has all the power, and he has overcome death and the grave. Yeah, he has defeated the works of the devil by overcoming sin and death. And ultimately, all of that will be destroyed when he comes back. Yep. Yep, and so, death is swallowed up in victory. And uh, in, verse, in chapter 15 of first. 1 Corinthians again, verse 55. O death, where is your sting? O Hades, where is your victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory, a victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. All right. Yep, and the sting of death was the sin that was exposed by the law. Yeah, through the law comes the knowledge of sin. But conquered by Christ in his death. Yeah. Yeah, God made Christ who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf so that we may become the righteousness of God. Yeah, and for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. Yeah, amen. And so... Since we got this promise of eternal life, new life in Christ, because of what he's done on the cross, then why should we, you know, be a part of a holiday that glorifies the opposite, death? Yeah, that doesn't make any sense. And then also in uh, 2 Corinthians 6, it says this in verse 14, which is actually a familiar verse. It says, Do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. What fellowship has righteousness with lawlessness? And what communion has light with darkness? And what accord has Christ with Belial? Or what part has a believer with an unbeliever? And what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For you are the temple of the living God. And as he said, I will dwell in them and walk among them, and I will be... Their people, and they shall be my God. And therefore, yeah, come out and be come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. Do not touch what is unclean, and I will receive you. So, MacArthur says that Christians are not to be bound with non-Christians in any spiritual enterprise or relationship that would be detrimental to the Christian's testimony within the body of Christ. And of course, you're not to be friends with the world, as it says in James. And this was important for Corinthians because of the threats from the false teachers and the surrounding pagan idolatry. Now, this does not mean that we should end all associations with unbelievers. Yeah, but that would defy for the purpose for which God saved believers and left them on the earth to uh, go and make disciples. Yep, and you don't have partnership, and Christ does not have any accord with Belial, which is basically another name for Satan. It means the utterly worthless one. And this contrasts sharply with Jesus, the worthy one who believers are to be in fellowship with. And the temple of God, true Christianity, and idols, 
they don't go together. They're incompatible. And believers are individually their spiritual houses, temples in which the Spirit of God dwells. All right. And then Galatians chapter 5 says this. Verses 9 through 21. I mean, sorry, 19 through 21. The works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanliness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambition, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, Envy, murders, drunkenness, revilery, uh, revileries, and the like, of which I told you tell you beforehand, just as I tell you in time, just as I told you in times past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. And yeah, so the works of the flesh, and then you get into the works of the spirit. But in there, you got sorcery and idolatry, which is a part of the history of Halloween. And then, and then Ephesians 5.11 says, Have nothing to do with unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them. And then also uh, Philippians 1.27 says uh, this, yeah, Let your conduct be worthy for the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or am I absent i may hear of your affairs that you stand fast in one spirit with one mind striving together for the faith of the gospel so macarthur says believers are to have integrity to live consistent with what they believe teach and preach and uh he calls for his call for genuine unity of heart and mind is based on the uh Necessity of oneness to win the spiritual battle for the faith and having love of others in the fellowship and having genuine humility and self-sacrifice and also the example of Christ who paved that sacrifice, who proved that sacrifice produces eternal glory. Yep, and we are to contend for the faith. That's what it says in Jude verse 3 as well. And then Hebrews 4 says this. Hebrews 4. Verses 14 through 16. Yeah. And we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens. Yeah. Jesus, the Son of God. You know, and let us hold fast to our confession. We do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are and yet, yet without sin. So let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain and find grace to help in the time of need. Again, going back to Christ as the only mediator that we can come to or go to. Yeah, so I guess refuting that idea uh, that was talked about beforehand of uh, of purgatory and then praying on behalf of the other deceased people. All right, and then uh, chapter 7, verse 24 through 25. Again, talking about Jesus interceding for us. He is the high priest who does that. Yep, and he, yep, and, uh, yep, and, uh, he offered up his, himself once and for all for our sins. And then, uh, also, verse 9, 27, it says this, and this would actually, probably, and this would actually go against that legend of, of that of where you get jack-o'-lanterns from it's appointed it's appointed for men to die once but after this the judgment and uh macarthur says this is a general rule for all of mankind of course he had a few exceptions 
Lazarus was raised from the dead, but then he ultimately died again. Yep, and then others who got raised as well. Yeah, like in the Old Testament and the New. And then Elijah and Enoch, they didn't die. They were taken up to heaven. And then, of course, you die, and then after that, the judgment. So it's just a general term encompassing judgment on all people. Yeah, and by the way, that Jack guy, yeah, he would have gone to hell, by the way. Yeah, and the devil would not have been the one who kept him out of hell. Yeah, because the devil's actually going to hell also. So that story is just foolish. It's unbiblical. But that's where you get jack-o'-lanterns. So, very, 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 very interesting. And then 3 John, verse 11, says this. Do not imitate what is evil, but what is good. He who does good is of God, but he who does evil has not seen God. Now, in context, it's talking about this guy named Diotrephes who was putting people out of the church and slandering John and his companions. And, and, uh, and uh, basically uh, calling the guy, this guy Gaius that John was writing to to not imitate that, but to imitate this guy Demetrius, who was, who was a good role model. Yeah, and he was being faithful. Yep, just like Gaius was. So imitate good, basically. Yeah. And so I guess in application, yeah, don't be doing the evil stuff associated with Halloween. Yeah, but you can imitate what is good. And I guess that could be some of that advice given by some of those Christian people of giving out tracts. I guess you can do it that way. And then Revelation 21 verse 4. And this will be the last scripture, and then I'll give some final thoughts, and then wrap it up. So, verse 4, He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, no more sorrow, no more crying, and there shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. Yep, the last enemy destroyed is death. Yep, and that happened. Yeah, whenever... Yeah, whenever Christ came back. Well, actually at the end of chapter 20. Yeah, death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire, yeah, which is the second death. Anybody that was not found in the book of life was thrown into the lake of fire as well. Yeah, so there's that fulfillment of what Paul said, that the last enemy to be destroyed is death. And Christ is the one that did that. Yep. Yep, he overcame it. Yep, defeated it. And then ultimately will destroy it when he comes back. Yep. And so therefore, why should we do something or be a part of something that honors it, that focuses on it? Hmm. Yep, and that's actually one of my first conclusions is that ultimately Halloween at the end of the day, what it's pretty much become, it ultimately is a glorification of death. Yep, and even those some of those days of the dead that are all over the world or whatever as well, it's focusing on death and, and, and the dead. And really in a way it can be kind of like the worshiping of ancestors sometimes yeah as as was done with druids and celts originally and then of course contradicts the bible like i showed with that jack-o'-lantern legend yeah and of course yeah death is not a part of god's original creation it was a consequence of our sin yeah, but never should have happened. Yeah, but it's our fault. It's Adam's 
fault. And then if Chris Roseborough was right about the history that he laid out when it came to Halloween and All Saints Day, if he was right that pretty much it actually started off good and it was more about remembering saints who had gone to glory, yep, and having confidence, giving Christians confidence for the days of head and, and talking about the end times and giving them hope, yeah, if that was really the case, then it became corrupted over time with the influence of the Roman Catholic Church and merging that paganism, Sawin stuff, you know, with the All Saints Day stuff. Yeah, just merging all of that together. So becoming corrupted. And then ultimately, another big problem is it can open the door to the occult. Yeah. Yeah, because I mean, because some people are going to be doing occultic things and practices on this day as well. Yeah, and that can be a big problem as well. And also, of course, the horror movies that are played on this day as well. That can also help open the occult. Yeah, and I've seen some of these horror movies. Yeah, they they are evil. Yeah. Yeah, but sadly they're just but sadly they're entertaining but they're evil. Yeah. And they can, you know, cause you to go down the wrong road. That's the thing. Yeah. The little leaven leavens the whole lump. So you need to watch out for that stuff. Yeah, as I'm yeah, all of us do. Yeah. And then probably advice would be similar to uh Really what some of, some of those other Christian YouTubers have said, maybe give out some candy. Maybe you can still do that, but don't wear bad costumes. Yeah, or maybe don't wear a costume at all. Maybe don't even do the trick-or-treating at all, especially for, you know, not causing others to stumble or not partaking of, you know, the cup of demons you know, that type of thing, those arguments. And also, don't watch horror movies. And ultimately, the main thing is to share the gospel. And I'm going to end by doing that. And I'm going to try to do it the way this other Christian YouTuber, uh, Sean Christie, at Revealing Truth. I'm going to try to share it in the same way that he does. If you died today, yeah... Where would you go, or whatever? I may not remember everything correctly. Yeah, if you died today, you know, where would you go? Yeah, but the fact is that we've all broken God's Ten Commandments, His law, and breaking God's law is called sin. Let's just start with a few examples. Have you ever told a lie? It only takes one to make somebody a liar. Have you ever taken something that wasn't yours, even if it was small? That makes you a thief. Or as Ray Comfort says, that makes you a lying thief. Have you ever said OMG or Jesus Christ in a bad way? In a moment of anger? Yeah. Saying God's name in vain? Yeah. Blasphemy? It's very serious. Now, taking the Lord's name in vain is not just cursing. It's also doing evil in God's name and also giving false prophecies in God's name and making false promises in God's name and so on, and being hypocritical. Those are other ways that that, can, that command can be broken as well. But the point is that all of us have broken God's laws, and, and the penalty for sin is death. And God's prison, yeah, to speak, is called hell. And just like in a court of law, a good judge is not going to overlook somebody's crime, God is not going to overlook ours. Yeah, he will not leave the guilty unpunished. But also in a court of law, if the fine is paid, the judge can act legally let you go, even though you're guilty. So if we stood before God today, we would be guilty of breaking his laws. That's where Jesus comes in. He lived a sinless life and he took the death penalty on our behalf. Yep. 
And the Bible says in the most famous verse, John 3, 16, that God loves us so much that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him or commits to Jesus shall have eternal life. Yeah, you shall have eternal life. So if you're not sure that whether or not you are saved or you've made that, uh, put your faith in Jesus, then admit that you're sorry for breaking his law and that you deserve judgment for this and that you want to receive mercy for this. Yep. Yep. And uh, 2 Corinthians 5, 17 says, If anybody is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away, and all things are new. And today is the day of salvation. And also, you don't need to do this special prayer or ritual in order to get saved you know just get honest before god and all that he knows everything anyway and if you're sincere ultimately and the lord knows your heart yeah he'll resist the proud but he'll give grace to the humble yeah yeah but if you're ultimately sincere or humble in heart i guess you could say and have a godly sorrow over your sin and not a worldly sorrow like simon the sorcerer had where you want to avoid the consequences but having the godly sorrow like david against you and you only have i sinned create in me a clean heart or that tax collector in luke 18 have mercy on me a sinner that type of thing yeah, you have that, then that's the godly sorrow that brings about repentance. Yeah, yeah, faith and repentance. Yep, and then you'll have the Spirit of God living in you when you get converted. And you'll see a lot of changes in your life. You'll begin to love what God loves and hate what He hates. Yep, and becoming more and more Christ-like and wanting to knock off the sin that still lingers the old man that's still strapped to your back yeah but don't wait another day because nobody is guaranteed that they'll that they will see tomorrow today is the day of salvation and that is ultimately the message that is the most important well well, I hope that you enjoyed this video. I know I probably may have missed some things or maybe gotten some things wrong, but, you know, you try to do it in one night, you can only get so much sometimes. All right, but Lord willing, I'll get back to Lamentations maybe another time, but until then, may God bless you and the grace and mercy won by Jesus, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all.